Welcome to the High Performance Hockey Podcast. Today, we're joined by Dr. Mal McHugh and Reg Grant. Mal is the Director of Research at the Nicholas Institute of Sports Medicine and Athletic Trauma at Lenox Hill Hospital, which is part of the Northwell Health System. Mal is also the Sports Performance Consultant for the National Hockey League. Reg is the Director of Human Performance at Holy Name Medical Center in Teaneck, New Jersey. He is a former president of the Strength and Conditioning Association of Professional Hockey and for 17 years, the head strength and conditioning coach of the New York Rangers. Reg specializes in leading interdisciplinary health, wellness, and athletic performance teams. This is a really fantastic podcast. We talk about decades of testing, the Batman and Robin of testing, if you will, in high performance hockey. Reg on the floor collecting the data and Mal analyzing the data behind the scenes. It's a really interesting talk and it's a really interesting conversation. We also speak about external load in ice hockey and a research article yet to be published by Mal uh, titled Accelerometer-Based Measurement of Physiological and Physical Intensity in Male Ice Hockey Players, an Algorithm for Quantifying Accelerometry Data in Ice Hockey, Identifying a Reliable G-Force Profile. Interesting article, interesting conversation, interesting talk. Last but not least, Moving the Needle in performance. Fantastic conversation. Welcome to the podcast. Welcome to the podcast, gentlemen. Thanks so much for joining us. Well, thank you for inviting us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Uh, really excited. Second timers on the High Performance Hockey Podcast unbelievable the value and content of the education that we've had so far from both of you. Uh, you've had uh, a, a unique relationship over many, many years in sports science and, and high performance sport. And I know we spoke offline about some of the target areas that we want to talk about today. And I want to hit them right off the get-go. So I want to ask the first question to Reg. And, and this really, this insights from decades and decades of testing and specifically, obviously, high performance hockey players how, where, and with whom did you accumulate this longitudinal data stream in terms of the testing high-performance hockey players? You're saying where did it kind of come from? How did we evolve yes. to this? Yes. Yeah. Really, it was uh, from an internship that, that I started with way back, and that was my exposure to uh, the Montreal Canadiens in the early 90s. Prior to that, I was, you know, university student. I'd been kind of a, you know, a high school athlete, gone through different things, but never really understood the dynamics of it. And then I was able to watch guys where the uh, the impact was different. It was literally their livelihood. And people were making business decisions based on, you know, people's ability to play or their interpretation of people's ability to play. And it's funny, one person, uh, it's a, a gentleman that, that worked in the NBA for a long period of time. He was talking to me about the dynamics of players understanding evaluation. And he goes, look, I just go up to my guys and I say, you're being judged. No matter what, you're being judged. So do you want to have objective measures that you can control that help that? Or do you just want somebody's opinion to rule the day? So when I started seeing things like that in, in pro sport back in the early 90s, and then I got to spend a great deal of time in the university environment as a student, as a sort of a staff member, it was giving me a picture that, okay, th there's something that we need to understand. And it's two parts. It gives an, an ability to objectively understand somebody, and it helps the athlete develop, get a sense of motivation around what's happening. And you know that can then lead into, okay, I get attached to, if I do this, I get this result. And that's where it sort of started. Now, the challenge becomes... Are we evaluating the right things? <laughs> are, <laughs> that's, you know, that's right. <laughs> are, you know, are we getting something in front of us that even though we see an improvement actually has an impact on the, the game and that type of thing? So I guess you could say it came back from guys that I worked with um, back in the time with, with them. And I was super fortunate. Um, I mean, Mal, him and I have been friends for a little more than 20 years now. Um, I was fortunate to come into uh, the Rangers 
and actually have a very advanced sounding board. Some things in life, you know, you, you work super hard and you make your own luck, but I got lucky getting into a certain space where I was able to tap into to Mal's brain. And the other part of something that I, I feel extremely passionate about is what we tap into and the people that we know um, is the network and the experience that they bring to those conversations. So Mal's got an infinite list of people that he's met and learned from, and I kind of was lucky enough to to be a witness and, and experience some of the things he's brought to that. So anyway, that's my short bit. Batman and Robin, Robin and Batman. So you and Mal have formed a friendship for a very, very long time. 17 years, Reg, in the National Hockey League. Explain to me that quote-unquote sounding board. Mal, I want to turn it over to you. How did you start working together? And then what is, what is it that you uh, were assisting in at that time and continue to assist it in throughout Reg's time with the New York Rangers? Back from when I started working in this field, we used to do the preseason physicals for the Rangers in like the early nineties. And okay. I went in, I got, I was the body fat guy. I was, you know, <laughs> rookie guy and it was like the most controversial guy, the measurement and people would complain about it. And then that kind of stopped uh, the mid nineties and then late nineties, the team doctor, who's one of our orthopedic surgeons, Bart Nissenson, came to me and says, look, the Rangers are looking for somebody to help with all their fitness testing. And I said, okay, I could, I could help with that. And I went and met with them and said, okay, let's go. What do you do? What do you measure? And, you know, I go in and I say, they say what they measure. And I say, okay, we can do that. And so the first year, and then I said, well, why do you do that? And, you know, and then I, each year I started to say, well, why, why would you do that? And then after like three years, Reg came in. And we just hit it off right away. And then, um, you know, like uh, do something simple like measuring uh, VO2 max. I'm going like, okay, you got 60 guys coming in. You got multiple systems here. Do you really need to have metabolic carts? We could just have them do a performance test on the bike and it might tell you just as much. And so we thought about that and we tried half. We looked at it without the metabolic cart, with the metabolic cart. And these, that just led to more things. And then we started to do in-season stuff and say, well, what do you do in season? We started, and then things kind of, well, what do you do for this? What do you do for that? And we started doing a little bit more, uh, a little bit differently and trying to basically figure out what is going on with the athletes over the, over the course of a season or from one season to the next season and just applying some objectivity and basically trying to figure things out on the fly. Uh, you know, over the course of a season, coaches are changing, you know, different staff members are changing. We just amassed a lot of data and we and we looked at it and we tried to use it to further things and to make advances in what we're doing. You know, they say science starts and ends with problems. I love this Karl Popper analogy. You have a problem, you have a temporary theory, you error eliminate, and then invariably another problem arises. So my question to both of you, and Reg, if you want to start, is, you know, Looking back now in the rear view, what were some of the big mistakes or maybe small mistakes you made along the way that iterated over time to improve your process? Was it a test? Was it, you know, studying history and only to find out that you had a Spanish exam? Was it timing? Was it communicating with coaches? Was it all the above? What were some of the mistakes that happened and occurred to you throughout the course of your high performance with the Rangers? Well, you might have to make this a three-hour podcast. For that <laughs> uh, the, uh, so uh, it, quite simply, moving before thinking. Like it, it can all be summed up in that. There's many different examples of that. There's a lot of things where I'm like, we're, we need to move. And the ability to execute, the ability to, to take action and move, that was always happening. One thing pro sport is not short of is, is activity. <laughs> There's a lot that's going on. And so I would always be looking. One of my challenges is to exist in a space with people that kind of understand where I am and what I'm talking about, because I continually live two to five years from today. Like I'm thinking about, you know, like what, where can this go? Like I've got, you know, let's say I've got a staff of three. I'm thinking of a staff of 10. I'm thinking of different things. I'm, I'm, where are we going? And, and I'm no sure, I'm not short on the thought around that. The one benefit um, that has happened professionally with uh, all of the time Mal and I have spent together is there's, there's a counterbalance, right? There's, there's an ability to go, okay, hold on. Thanks for all of that. We need to move effectively now. 
and we need to do it in a week. And what, what do we need to think about to do that? So to sum it up, I probably moved before I thought too often than not. There is something that everybody gets caught up in, which might be, well, let's say you get a coach that's in there and the coach is interested in some information they read, a friend of theirs told them. So now you're talking about something that's actually 18 steps down the line about some graph on some heart rate. And at the end of the day, the athlete had to get up. They had to do some element of preparation and they had to practice or play. Quite simply, that's what, no, there's no heart rate advance metric to that. Sure, you can go into HRV, you can go into all the different things, but there's a simplicity to the daily routine people have to go through. One of the things that happened, there was a, a, a woman, Dr. Lisa Callahan. This is, this is back uh, when I was with the team. And when she came in, she's like, all right, let's look at starting from the, the beginning. Let's, let's simplify this. What are the things we look at? And at the time, I was doing so much stuff. I was just doing so many things. And uh, and it's like, oh, that there's pause there. And I'm kind of like, well, no, we're we're already doing these things. Like, like, let's keep going. We're looking at imbalances on single leg jumps and and not only an imbalance in the ability to produce force, but the ability to control the body during that force. And we're pulling back and having conversations about body weight and frequency of that. And to, so anyway, there just just to say I I probably moved before I thought too many times. And maybe my patients, because I would see people that were thinking that weren't acting, and I'm like, we need to move, right? And there's a balance of that. And, and I think I'm continually in my life trying to, to find the balance of, okay, we're thoughtfully moving forward. And one of the benefits of what Mal and I have been able to, to do, and, and for this is really strange, I've been in this field for 25 years, and I just feel like I'm getting started. And I feel like I'm I'm not knowing a whole bunch of stuff and I continually try and figure it out. Anyway, I can keep talking, but that that's really the the crux of it. Outstanding, Mal. I want to pass a baton to you on that in terms of some mistakes that you've made. You may have a different lens to this, but uh, during your time working with Reg, and I know you still continue to do so, but in high performance hockey, what are some of the mistakes that you feel that you've iterated over time or were aha moments for you? My mentor, Dr. James Nicholas, is one of the founders of sports medicine. He used to say, uh, we are limited by what we can measure. And I've learned over time what we think we're measuring, we're maybe not measuring. And <laughs> what we think is an important measure is not. So a, a good, like, I'm very granular about stuff as opposed to Red sees the big picture. I go in and look at the very, very small picture. So one of the things is like, you know, people, fitness testing, hockey guys, you need a high aerobic capacity and a high anaerobic capacity and high aerobic capacity that helps you recover when you're doing the anaerobic work. There's that whole thing. I actually saw that written in a piece yesterday about baseball and baseball pitchers needing a high anaerobic capacity. I just started to laugh. And I'm going, because the actually, that, that's not, true and i found out from our own our own data like we go so let's look at the guys with a high aerobic capacity and the guys with a low aerobic capacity and let's look at their recovery when we're giving them repeated anaerobic bouts like say three lap tests and they do six three lap tests with a minute or two between them and we say you know what aerobic capacity has no contribution whatsoever to that athlete's ability to recover from repeated bouts of a high anaerobic work and it's like, and I go, wow, I've been going for like five years saying that that's important. And when you get the data and, and just because something has a sound rationale doesn't mean it's right. And that's my job as a sports scientist, physiologist to figure out what is right and what's not right. It's not for the guys with the team in the battlefield, they have to rely on what is the science is out there. And our job is to refine the science and make sure the science is correct and that it's useful. It has utility to the actual athletes and the people looking after the athletes. Let me piggyback on that a little bit because Mal brought up some real sort of specific examples of things that that he found there. And one of the uh, one of the things I I went through, and and I bet you a lot of the people out there that are listening because they're really with athletes and coaches, right? They're they're in that team environment. And what I found is the boardroom, the coach, the GM, 
those people, they'll respond to certain things, right? They want the environment to be distilled into a graph, into a number. And there's, there's the tendency to get them to a place where, you know, they want to be pleased. We want to please them. We want them to see that things are going. And understanding the, the area that you actually control and the role that the performance, the conditioning that those things play to the actual outcome of the game is critical, right? So Stu McMillan, Matt Price, different types of guys that have that have dealt with, and you know, Stu from from Alpha and stuff like this. These are guys that really have spent some time recently when I've talked with them about understanding what the impact is. So if you take things that are in the performance development space or development performance space, and you say, "All right, we're going to figure out how to make the engine better. We're going to figure out how to make the mind better." That's producing somebody that is more capable and has more opportunity to be better during practice during those things where the coaches then come in and take control and teach them and put them into technical and tactical different situations. And then they take them and they put them into game situations. You get the point, there's different segments of being removed from the end result. And so when Mal's talking about, you know, hey, we thought this and we're, we're what's the result of aerobic, anaerobic, the impact of aerobic and anaerobic. When I'm looking at coaches and the people that are delivering information to, it's important to give context to it. It's important, just like we need to understand what's important aerobically, anaerobically as, as that balance. We need to help the people above us and around us understand the importance of what goes on. So we have some athletes that are absolutely phenomenal. They're consistent with their habits. Are they the best aerobically, anaerobically? Okay, that's debatable. We can develop that. They're consistent with their habits. They're not yo-yo up and down all over the place. And we control the environment that they develop and train in. And when we have that and we relay that, we're now you know, kind of scripting the narrative that, look, we're there to produce the best possible people for you that's really strong mentally, physiologically, and you know, physically. And, and now you guys can then take it and go from there. Trying to go in and really like our work wins games. <laughs> well, <laughs> thanks, but you know, there is some impact there. But if a coach decides to put a couple of guys on the ice where it should have been a couple other guys, can you do right? So anyway, I did. There's just the context of things. Sorry, I went off on a tangent. But no, no, absolutely. And I want you to, uh, Mal. You and I had spoken briefly before we got on the podcast about the influx of measurements, metrics, 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 technology. I, I, I know that the landscape was probably very, very different 17 years ago than it is now. We have measurements for everything: adductor squeeze tests, external load, heart rate, internal load force plates, oxygen monitoring, saturation, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, I, I wrote about this in the past, and, and, and I truly believe this. You know, all of these measures are taking a reductionist approach to complex systems. We're measuring one small piece of a massive puzzle. My question is, what do you believe those limitations are right now? Are those limitations, are we picking the wrong measurements? Are we measuring too many things? And then how has it evolved? I know it's a piggyback question, but how has that evolved to the current time? 17 years ago, you started working with Reg. Technologies change. What are the, the valid and reproducible technologies that you use and you know, are they important? So part of the problem with any of the technologies that get used across sports is that the end user does not have the human resources to manage the data. Mm -hmm. And there's too much data there. And Back 2012, I think it was, 2011, I said to Reg, how do you know how stressful that last night's game was on that player? And how are they doing today? How do you do that? How do you? And so he talked about different measures. And we say, well, you know, something we could do, force plate jumps and look at that. Or, or you could monitor the athletes so they weren't allowed to wear devices. And I said, well, can others, can your AHL team wear devices? So we looked into wearing devices. So I listened to your podcast in Catapult, which was fascinating for me because in 2012, I went and spoke to Catapult and said, um, do you do any work in hockey? And they said, no. And I said, well, if I bought one of your units, 
can I access the data? He says, what do you mean? He says, well, I just, I don't care about your GPS data or anything. I just want your accelerometer data. And I just want the data. I don't want any of your analyses. He says, oh no, we don't do that. I says, well, what, what, what could you do for me? He says, well, if you bought four units and you got us 100 hours of data, we can build the algorithms for you. And I'm going like, I don't like anybody that uses the word algorithm. I just want a device that gives me data and I know what I want to do with it. So I, I said, this is, they're not in the game here. So a friend of mine said, look, you know what? There's a IT guys in the university beside me and they develop these little accelerometers and they cost a hundred dollars. And I said, okay, that sounds sensible. So we started with that. I started with a college hockey team. They're not even, I don't even think they're division three. There might be some other obscure thing. I got data on them. I started putting these things on everybody. And then we started with training camps and we put them in training camps. And then we started amassing data and we, and we reduced it down to four numbers where we looked at physiologic stress and physical stress. And then from that physiologic intensity and physical intensity. And those were four numbers that we used and we were able to describe players across the season from year to year, development players, and it, it had some utility. It wasn't, it was a massive data for me to pull out four numbers, but for the end user, that's what we wanted to keep it simple and provide something that we thought was useful. How useful it was, that's for Reg to say, because I was in the background going, I think it's useful. Reg, you can, you can piggyback on that if you'd like. Uh, uh, you know, your time with the Rangers, essentially starting that program from the ground up. How did you procure the technologies? Was it a, was it talking with 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 Mal and saying, hey, you know what matters here? How can we measure it? How can it be more precise the measurement? And then obviously twofold. I mean, are you communicating with your team the limitations of those measures? And I don't mean the head coach, but I mean internally. Uh, well, extreme, yes. Okay, <laughs> a lot of answers to that. Um, I'll, I'll throw one into this, and this is just a, a little kind of nugget to the thing you mentioned. Kind of what mistakes were made. I collected data, massive amounts of data, without an understanding of the infrastructure that was needed, and maybe without a clear understanding of the outcome. Okay. We had a very interesting thing that we wanted to know, just like Mal said. We wanted to understand, and now they're talking about load management. We wanted to understand what the athletes were under. There's an ability to understand what they can actually do Think of the athlete out, right? So what are they actually doing? How fast? How high do they jump? How, you know, whatever that is. But then what can they actually handle? What's coming to them? The different things about travel, about stress, whatever. So those are the, the types of things. And when I started to give you a little bit of a timeline, we were in a, a facility. I don't know if I mentioned this on the last podcast, where in Madison Square Garden, this is this is prior to a massive renovation. Hockey was down the pecking order. I won't say how, how far down, but I think Billy Joel was way above us and the Knicks and other things. It's an entertainment <laughs> mecca, right? The, sure, literally, sure. there's there's the garden and there's the Staples Center. Those are the two meccas. And now there's other things that are out there, but there was a lot. So it was multi-use. There was so many things going on. The sole extent of the training environment for the New York Rangers prior to the renovation was the New York Knicks locker room. We went into the locker room with two carts, a whole bunch of weights, and just tried to maintain strength. We had a bike room that was jammed with 12 bikes. So to give people the idea that sometimes there's a myth around, oh, I can't do what the pros do. There's so much money. We don't have those resources. Uh, like I know this might be consumed by the public, so I won't use the words I want to. That's garbage. <laughs> Everybody has limitations and it's not what makes you successful is having all these bells and whistles and massive things. So we needed to be able to pick a starting point, right? And we didn't have anything at the time. Mal mentioned catapult and the things that were limited from the data. A catapult device was big. At the time it was large. So you're looking at something that was like an inch wide, maybe three quarters of an inch is thick. Maybe it was more than an inch wide, two inches wide, but four inches tall. It was a big thing. So you stick that on the back of somebody's shoulder pads or you stick it on the sacrum. There's a massive issue 
with a guy that's making five, 10 million a year, you know, getting hit into the boards. And now there's this implement that's, you know, jamming into their body that was out. So heart rate was the way that we went to try and understand what was happening with somebody. In 2005, prior to any of the different liability things, we were running ISO cam. This is from the network, right? We were running MSG network isolated cameras on individuals during the game, and we would run a replay of their heart rate. And we started looking at heart rate and started going through that path. And then, you know, it was like, where can we go from there? And I mean, I, there was one very specific moment where I had, you know, the owner come in and next thing I know, I'm with the coach, the GM and the owner in the New York Knicks court, and we need to buy Catapult. And that's kind of a part where Mal was talking about, you know, let's investigate that a little bit. And at the end of the day, those limitations logistically, short battery life, the implement stuck on the body, the, all these different things didn't allow us to do it. And we'd been doing heart rate for a while by that point. And, you know, similar to the catapult thing and Adam Douglas and others experience, heart rate told us something, but we knew we were missing something else, right? And so then we started going into the, the work that Mal described of understanding just simply G-Force. Hence to the people that, you know, the question you had right from the beginning, simplify whenever possible, make sure your data is clean, what you collect, you're going to use these, these types of things. So anyway, that's sort of how that kind of evolution of things started is we picked something and we started to grow. Now, the idea of wanting to please the people that you work for, be careful mm. of that. <laughs> I had somebody walk in and within a four hour period, we were spending about a million and a half and we were going like we were moving. Now, good things, good technology, good companies, good people didn't have the infrastructure to support it in the way that it needed to. We still went and did all things and made, uh, you know, really made some impact in certain areas. But looking back on it, and this is where I talk about living, you know, a couple of years from where I am, you know, in hindsight, I, I think that you know, I could have done most of the things I've done better. And at the end of the day, we're trying to help a group of people be better than they were yesterday. It's funny. I, I, there's so much stuff out there with Kobe Bryant right now. And, you know, do people hate losing? Do they love winning? Whatever. And it's the process. It's being consistent with the daily process that you go through. And one of the things that um, I'm off topic for your question, but one of the things that I've learned to continually ask myself is, all right, I have I got a decision in front of me. What if it's wrong? Mm -hmm. What if what I think about this is not true? What are the repercussions? Analyze it. Look at it. My conversations with Mal helped me immensely on that. As he mentioned before, I kind of have a little bigger, broader vision to it. And he's really excellent at the details of stuff. But but that's sort of how that was. You know, we we layered things on until a point at which, man, we just exploded. That kind of brought us to the point where it was like, okay, we need to really figure this out, right? Like we're being asked to utilize and implement catapult irregardless of the cost to 25 guys on two teams. So now you got 50 guys. Uh and then we, you know, Mal found some other things that helped us and it was a little less impact. So anyway, that's that's how that sort of evolved. But yeah, it's been an interesting ride, I'll tell you that. So so we've talked about the process. We talked about starting with a problem. We talked about mistakes. Mal, I'm going to turn this over to you. <clears throat> you know, looking back again, uh, and, and currently right now, what do you feel that some were the biggest insights that you made? Oh, wow, Anthony, the, the hockey, X, Y, Z, it's an aerobic, it's it's uh, it's body fat throughout the course of the season. What are some things, and you've presented on going over years and years of combine data as well, but what are two or three of the big insights over the years that you've made that, that you could sum up? Uh, so actually, if I speak specifically about the uh, G-Force data, yes. which aligns very much with some of the discussions in the Catapult, discussion in the podcast you had a, a yes. few weeks ago yes and i'm going like when people, so guys were saying something i said oh that's what we saw right from the outset like something like one day we were collecting on ice data at training camp and the guys are wearing the stuff i don't need to see what they're doing because i know okay they're going to be doing sprint tests and we're doing these three lab tests and then and so i'm getting the data the next day and I'm looking at it like I'm like and so we were everyone's interested in how hard was that hit how hard is a hit in the game or whatever and I says you're never really 
you don't want to know how hard one hit was. You want to know what the total accumulation was on the player. So I'm thinking, you know, people getting hit, so is it going to be big? And we can accumulate the, num- the amount of time above a certain G-force threshold. And we'd identified that. We went over a threshold. Okay, all this re- represents hits. And then I saw this data and I went, whoa, I called up Reg. What the hell were the guys doing after they did the sprints? Oh, they were doing some shooting drills. And I said, well, what type of shooting drills? So I went and I looked, okay, what did they do at the second shooting drill? Because I saw like a little activity, a little activity. What was the shoot? She says, oh, that was slap shots. And I'm going like, I'm not a hockey guy. And I'm going like, that's more stressful than most of the hits we're looking for. And it was this torque on the body in a slap shot is a massive stress on the body. And so the guys were saying that about how when you're trying to measure skating load in practice, you need to know when they're doing slap shots because that's going to give you an artificially high number. And I'm going like, well, it's not artificially high. That's a pretty significant stress on the body. When it, that was, So that was like a aha moment about, you know, we got to understand what the stresses are on the body. And... You, you know, if someone's out, that's almost like a pitcher going out and throwing, uh, you know, 60 pitches when nobody knows he's pitching, you know, and that's baseball guys deal with that all the time uh, in terms of the load on the body. So that was one aha moment. And the other thing was just understanding how variable the patterns of movement, the loads are for defensemen. Some are very low intensity, some are high intensity, whereas the forwards are more homogeneous. They're, they move faster and they're more homogeneous and they're more physical and that's more homogeneous than the defensemen. And that then when we look at it and we go, so we have a measure what we think represents a high physiologic intensity. So when you're on the ice, you're moving quickly and you're shifting. I think of it as shiftiness. And we went, 80% of the AHL forwards were above this threshold. And then when we look at the development players, not as many of the development players in, in tournaments, and we actually found it to be predictive of who's going to make it as a professional hockey player. So that was like, okay, we actually have something that is measuring what we think. We are not limited by what we can measure here because we're, we're actually measuring something that is telling us something about the athlete. I want to get to this because it is part of our next series of questions. I want to talk all about the external load, the G-force, et cetera. I want one more question to ask before we get into this. And it's a rhetorical question, but I'm going to ask anyway. Why does it matter? Here's my challenge, and I say this to everybody. You know, Mike Boyle, a good friend and colleague, said a lot of times he uses this analogy. Sometimes we pick the pepper out of the fly shit. Okay, great. X percent of this, X percent of that. You know, getting your modified reactive strength index up as if that's going to create, uh, you know, five more goals on the power play and win games. My question is to both, and, and perhaps, Reg, you, you, could, you could answer this at the start. Maybe it's something small. What kind of targeted interventions did you make with some of the data that you collected during the time as a practitioner? Meaning, hey, Anth, we collected a lot of stuff. Here's how we acted on some of this. Does that make sense? Hey, Anthony, uh, you know, his vertical jump was down 10% today. So we did X, Y, Z today. Or his questionnaire was down. We did X, Y, Z. The targeted interventions that you used decision-wise once you read these numbers and collected this data. Hmm. So you bring up an interesting point, And it's actually the simplicity of the whole thing that, that's really important because there will be a path that people take. As an example, you look at the tip of the spear, whether it's special forces, whether it's people that are, who are those, those you know, handful of guys running the hundred, men, women, doesn't matter, <laughs> yeah, right? Yeah, In the Olympic yeah. games every four years. And everyone looks to them, what's the tool, the technique, the nutrition, what, to your point, is the reactive strength index, let's rip apart the force curve, let's, you know what I'm saying? Like there's yes. a lot of depth and detail to it. The end of the day, the simplicity of the habits that they apply on a day-to-day basis separates those. Now, I'll, I'll little, give a little bit of a, a proviso, whatever you want to call it, a little bit of a, a reflective point to it. There are some that are just extremely talented, and there are a group that are very skilled to perform whatever it is. All that being equal, the consistency of application on a day-to-day basis sets it apart. 
you will see many athletes that go from middle, high school, collegiate university level through that space that are exceptional. Their talents, their ability to shoot the ball, shoot the puck, whatever it might be, right? Throw the ball, right? Quarterback. They're incredible. And then you go to the tip, the pro environment, and you look at the guys that are quietly executing whatever it is that they need to, their craft, on a day-to-day -day basis. They just do it better than everybody else. They just do. There, there's no way around that. When you look at youth sport, and there's a massive amount of stress and strain from some parents pushing, 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 you get to the pro environment, those parents aren't there. Those kids burned out. They really did. And when we look at um, some of the things Mal was talking about, where it's like, well, what is good, right? What is good? What does that, what does that really matter? If you're in a situation where your focus shifts from the daily work of the athlete to the need to get an RSI number, to a need, I need the force curve. I cannot act if I don't have the force curve. I'm just a firm believer that that's not true. Those things are relevant. I've had the luxury of working with Mal to tease out some of these things. There was a time where, you know, we never looked at force plates. We didn't. Sure. And then we started to. And then Mal went through all this stuff. And I mean, he'll tell you, this can well, take a whole day. He kind of well, goes, well, well, not to interject, but now you can spend a whole day looking at a jump. Oh, it's unbelievable. 50, 56 and, and Mal, metrics. Listen, I'm, Mal, I'm going to sum this thing up. You basically look at it and, and you and I have had this conversation and you're kind of like, why do they call this all this stuff? This metric and this metric and this metric, that's just this one. You know, and, and a, I'm not using the specific metric specific. That's but another it's, podcast. And it's all yeah. about it. Hey, we're, we're coming back for round three, Mal. Don't I worry. Don't look at the yeah. metrics, I look at the curve. It's, yeah. like a, it's, like a, it's like an EKG to me. I look at it. But anyway, yeah. that's it. But why does it matter? Is uh, so I had an uh, immediate answer to that was uh, oh the, the reason it matters is Gregory Dupont is my answer guy I've never met before but he's the first author on one of the most impactful sports medicine sports science papers I've ever read and it was on professional soccer and it was looking at one team and it was looking at their performance if they're playing their second game in six days or their first game in six days. So they've had short rest versus long rest. And they look at performance metrics and the performance metrics were not impaired. They were doing the same number of sprints, same number of distance, high speed distance, all these GPS related metrics. Everything was good. The results were good when they were on short rest. Nothing was impaired. They had six times the injury risk on short rest versus long rest. So. We are limited by what we can measure and that they weren't able to measure the stress on the athletes. There was some subclinical stress that they weren't able to see and the guys are getting hurt because they're playing on short rest. So why does it matter? We need to be able to measure the stress on our athletes and know what stress they can take and what stress is going to be too much. When we started doing our accelerometer work, there was a guy in the AHL team and he was like busting his gut every single game. And it just, I had like data on physical and phys physiologic stress and intensity. And he was more than two, two, standard, two standard deviations above everyone. And I'm going like, guys, this guy, what are you doing to him? And uh, I said, I know nothing about whether he's a good player or a bad player. Does he get rest? Are you helping him with recovery? And it turns out the guy, Ended up going from AHL. Now he's a regular, he's probably six, seven, eight years now in the NHL. But he was struggling around in the AHL for whatever. But I'm going like, that's a guy who's putting out effort. It really told us a story about that player. So, sure. you know, this is why it matters being able to understand what is happening to the players because it's there's things going on that we don't see. And then we see it when the guy breaks down. Sure. Yeah. And so when you're looking at this stuff and in that case, right, there are some things we can and things we can't control. Being able to identify some of that stuff, right, the, to go, OK, we can help this like I did what Mal was saying, right, who this player was. I mean, what we couldn't control. Some people just didn't like them. 
in that space, there were some people that that just thought for whatever reason they would not be addition to the club. Gets traded, been in the pros for a bunch of years now. <laughs> so there's there's some interesting things in, in that space that that you can and can't control. And and that's okay. And and to give an example of where we were and where the element of understanding G-Force, if you want to call it that, right? But understanding actual impact on the body is that we knew when we started looking in depth at heart rate, and Al talks about the example of all the metrics that were done on the club that, you know, the six times injury rate, that type of thing. Well, we started looking at probably four or five different scenarios. So when we wanted the results of a game, what happened before that? Was there a day off? Was there a game? Was it a day off game game? Was it a day off of practice, a game game? What were the different scenarios? Or was it a game practice game, right? And we really looked at probably uh, five of the most common of those. And the interesting part about having a day off and then a practice and then two games, a back-to-back, the coach at the time had a belief that if you had a day off, they were well-rested. That next practice should be the hardest practice. So they exhausted them. And now you think about what you're measuring and why it's important. We wanted to see how productive they were. We didn't get to the point where we could look at the injuries yet, right? That was That's another extension of that prediction. But it's important is we were horribly not successful. It was really bad at the uh, in the second of the back-to-back whenever we had a day off of practice in a game game. Every single time. Because the way to come out of a day off for this coach was to have the hammer the guys, where we found that when we helped educate, and there might be, let's say, a practice, a day off, a practice in that scenario, whenever you were going to have lag or recovery time, we wanted the before recovery time to be very intense. So the impact was let's pay attention to how we come out of rest time. Let's ramp them up a little and not hammer them. We did that understanding heart rate, and it became more effective when we could look at more metrics like G-Force. Getting right into G-Force. Mal, I'm going to open it up to you. External load in ice hockey, accelerometer-based measurement of physiological and physical intensity in male ice hockey players and an algorithm for quantifying accelerometry data in ice hockey, identifying a reliable G-Force profile. Now, correct me if I'm wrong, I don't believe that is officially published yet. I think that's on the docket to be published. Am I right? Correct. I got to write that up. Um, I'm writing up... uh... Vertical jump study first. It's on the uh, it's on the list, and that basically we started. We did that. That was data we did with a USHL team, okay. and essentially what we did with Reg for since 2012 was proprietary. We're doing it for a team. It's not research. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, we both said we got to do some research on this and so get it. So, cause we're not about like going hiding things and saying, oh, this is, we got the little secret sauce here or whatever. It's about advancing the science. So I said, you know what, we'll do this. I'll do the full analysis that you really didn't have time. So when we're working with Reg, we're going with somewhat of a gut, let's pick this threshold, let's pick this threshold. For example, we, we picked our physiologic stress threshold used to be time above 2G. Now we've got it down to time above 1.4 G. That seems like, what's the difference? It just, it was a little bit more sensitive of a measure. So this study basically validates to a certain extent what we'd been doing for seven years and also helps us refine it. So the idea was to monitor these players over the course of a season and see how they change from game to game the team and each individual player, how consistent their profiles were, what happened over the course of the season, was it highly variable? Did it depend on the number of days that were off or did it depend on the level of competition? And we find that things were very consistent, but we also find that what were the best numbers to look at in terms of consistency and also to see things change like regular season versus playoffs, forwards versus defensemen. And one of the things that we went, we found was like, 
the intensity, physiologic intensity, which is basically your high speed skating, was down a little bit in the playoffs. And this was when they when they won the championship, the Clark Cup. And I went, what? And what? Why is that? And then I realized I went look back and basically is. I'm not the hockey guy. I look at the stuff and says, they're leaning on all their studs. They're playing more minutes and they're pretty much maintaining their output, but it's taking a little bit lower on their physiologic stress. But what went up was their physical stress, meaning they were being more physical when they were on the ice. They may not have been as shifty, but they were being more physical because and the, the, the drop was more because you're spreading the... the the time on ice over fewer players. But when those players were out there, they were being more physical. So that was, you know, that's what we're, it helps us understand, okay, this is how you could use this. My whole approach is we have all these devices and they measure, you know, GPS is basically measuring position. And from position, we can get velocity and then we can get the distance. And I said, in hockey, that's useless. You could skate around circles forever really fast. You're not actually stressing your body very much. It's basically the difficulty in hockey is trying to ha- trying to generate friction on a frictionless surface. It stops, <laughs> stops, turns, hits, and that's we need to. That's why we need to just look at accelerometry data in in hockey and G force is the metric that they generally spit out so we go we could go with just accelerations but we go with g-force people kind of it's a sexier term people understand a little bit better and let's look at what that is and let's see if there is some utility of it now one of the things across all these that monitoring of what the player is doing in a game on the ice or in other sports we have all these measures very few if any have ever been shown to be related to how the player is the next day and the day after. So we got our guys, this guy had high stress in that game, accumulated a high load, whatever we want to call it. Well, is there anything we can measure the next day that shows how impaired he is? Is his vertical jump down? Is his strength down or subjective? The subject of recovery measures, how do you feel type measures? Uh, Do they relate to high? So we don't know what's important to take out of the game data until we know which metrics in the game data tell us where the guy is tomorrow and the next day. And that's the next step for me in terms of the utility of these things. I want to jump on this because there's a key element, right? And I'm looking at what we've talked about, what you sent before. What is the ideal G-Force profile, right? So you're getting all this information. Somebody's sitting here listening and they're like, unbelievable right they're listening to mal and they're, they're they're hearing all this stuff and like man i need these devices i need like let's go let's measure and let's get out there and let's help identify stuff well to my original point those that are not in the trench looking at this consuming this are generally looking for singular pieces of information that allow them to go they're a good or a bad player they're productive, they add or they don't to our team, right? Let's simplify that and figure out, hey, they've got a great profile, that's predictive of something. If you get into that game, stop. (laughs) Like, absolutely stop. It's not that simple. Because we went and we started going to Mal's point, right? Prior to the other data, it was like, ooh, you're a forward, that physical, the impact ability, that physical force, but also physiological, if you've got a a bigger engine and you're out there and you're moving around, that's a pretty good thing, generally, right? And then we get into playoffs, Mal does all this different kind of stuff, well, there's a different impact and understanding of the data. But now you've just grouped 12 people together. Sure, top six, bottom six, you split it apart, then you go with your, you know, your checking line, your fourth, and, and you start teasing these things out. And then you sit there and you go, okay, you've just created something that, let's say, a differentiated top six, bottom six G force during the game. Let's say that's what you did. And you've convinced the coach that certain things are good and certain things are bad. And all of a sudden, somebody on the fourth line is getting, you know, reprimanded because they're not really producing at a level that somebody thinks they should because they're supposed to be checking and physical. And then you have somebody that actually understands the game, could be a former player, could be whatever watch that player on the ice and realize, well, of course, Reg, they're they're not going crazy all over the place because they're in the right spot every single time. 
Sure. They know how to look at the game. They know how to see the game. They know how to anticipate where the game is going. And they can put themselves into a certain situation with a loss, a lot less effort and energy expenditure than others. So this is something where there is no ideal G-Force profile that is blanket ac across groups. I wanted to peel back. Just I'm going to ask a rudimentary question. Mal, forgive my ignorant question. But why why measure G-Force as opposed to traditional player load, right? Player load is the accumulation of vertical, lateral, and linear accelerations throughout the course of the game, right? So so the G-Force, peel that back for me. Talk to me like a five-year-old. What what are we measuring there? Just the impact on the body? Someone taking a hit, exact, giving a hit? It's exact, it's the exact same thing. So they just don't give the units. Catapult don't give the units. They call it player load. And if you look, AU, arbitrary units. Stat ah. sports. Stat sports, which have a large footprint in professional soccer and, and professional rugby, pretty much the same device. They give they give it in G forces. So I was okay. talking to them, I went, oh, that's good. And then they said, yeah, we'll give you the data, whatever. So that's exactly the same thing. It's just <sighs> it's acceleration. So you can stand still. You can call it zero, but it's we call it when you're standing still. There's one G this way and there's zero g that way and zero g that way because you're not moving then once you start moving so the the vertical is always in the baseline and it helps me when i get the tracings of it because then i know uh I, I know the orientation of the player or whatever because these are pretty cheap devices we're using you know the the, I the, the thing the reason some of these things they'll have a, a gyroscope in them and the other things is so when you fall over it knows that the, the direction that was then vertical, now it's this one's vertical. And it's just so you can correct that. We don't do that. We just take the resultant, the resultant G-force uh, every one hundredth of a second, and we do the accumulation of that. Okay, how much time was spent above a certain threshold? So it's the same. So this is what I wanted to do with the catapult back in 2012. Just give me the data and let me apply this approach. And heart rate uh, was the same thing. Just looking at how much time is someone spending above a uh, 90% of their heart rate max. How much time is someone spending above? So we're just saying, how much time is someone spending above 2G? Got it. So time above 4G is, we think, a physical stress. And time above 1.4G is high-speed skating, which there's that would be the high load or whatever the catapult have. It's, and I bet you, if I go and look at their algorithm, it's probably pulling exactly what we're pulling. It's, you know, it's a huge so, so in that article, essentially, that the forces as a percentage of total time on ice, you're bake, basing that based on the G's of a 60-minute game at 1.2, 1.3, correct? So you're seeing the physical external load, for lack of a better word, of the various time frames in a game based on measuring G's, correct? Correct, because this is very rudimentary stuff. We stick these things, the, the battery lasts for two weeks. We stick them on their pads and the, the, the teams will mail them back to us after two weeks. So I can see when they're in the back of a truck on the highway and it's going like this because it's collecting data. It doesn't turn off, turn on. Sure. And then we go, okay, there's a game on, on, the, on the 5th of October, uh, 7.30 to 9.30. I pull that data and I pull out and then I analyze it and move on to the next game, move on to the next game. Um, and that's, it's very, very basic. It's very easy for a company to come in and say, okay, yeah, we can, we can refine this process for you very easily. You know, sure. and we're just trying to prove a principle. This is an inexpensive way of monitoring players and providing a profile of the player and what they're doing over the, over a course of time. Interesting. So Anthony, you get the idea that in the complexity that sometimes exists in the space of specifically monitoring position and movement and G's and orientation, there's a world of complexity there that oh. at times you can get lost in what's the metric and what's the thing and what's all that stuff. What you just listened to is what I've been fortunate enough to hear for a long period of time. And how can we distill that? to just simple exposure, because really we're trying to understand what the athlete's going through, right? To some extent what they can do, but, but what, they're, what they're going through, what stress they're under. And then the actual applicable part is 
well, what's that mean? So you got to understand what type of player they are, what they were asked to do, what, you know, what impact they have on the game. Like you start peeling back and adding that piece of information into the other, into the other parts. First of all, let, let me, let me, let me finish by saying, I want to respect Mal. Is there anything you'd like to add on that external load piece? Cause I know that, that, that there was, did I miss any of the questions on, on, on that research in that article? I don't think so, but something to play on from something Reg just said. So I look at the stuff and we do, we used to do reports for players and, and I'll say, if this guy is contributing on the ice, playing well, the coach is saying he's playing well, he can probably play more shifts because his stress level is very low. He's not a high stress guy. So if he's contributing, you know, he, he, you're not burning him out by playing him in, you know, 16 minutes a game. You could move that up longer. Or if somebody has just got this high intensity, high stress, will say, if this guy's not contributing on the ice, there's nothing you can do. He's busting his gut. He's fit. It's, this is by coaching. He maybe just isn't good enough. So we got that. So that's the way I tell people to use the information. He said, we'll tell you what they're doing. I know nothing about hockey. I'm not going to say this guy should be starting. I'm just going to say, if this guy, you can use him more, you can use him less or watch. He may not be recovering. He's seeing more stress than somebody else. Got it. Moving the needle. Uh, we texted back and forth on this. Obviously, the end goal here in, in high performance sport is winning. I know this perhaps is a long-winded response from you both because it's a it's a pretty big question. What are the gaps that you see right now today in sports science? I think I mentioned the gap that I'm most interested in filling is basically trying to figure out uh, what we can measure the load on the player in the game that relates to how they are today, how they are tomorrow, the day after the game, and the day after, and the day after, and when they're going back to play their next game. How fresh are they? We don't have good metrics for that. Uh, to a certain extent, we think we do, but we don't. We don't know what in-game data relates to how they're going to recover. And I've done a ton of work in recovery, and there's certain things in recovery. Massage is one, uh, which is an innocent one. There's other ones where people have got lots of expensive equipment, and everyone's buying into it. And I saw if the Ryder Cup team using one of the pieces of equipment the weekend. I go, oh my God. But basically, there's a lot of stuff out there that makes you feel really good after you've done it and for the next couple of hours, but has zero impact on how you're feeling or more importantly, how you're going to perform tomorrow or the next day. And I'm interested in what we can do to make the athlete perform better tomorrow and the next day as opposed to making them feel good now so like, you know, the, the, the guy that gets all the attention is Tom Brady because he lasted 100 years playing in the NFL. You know, his pajamas, his special pajamas did not help him play better. <laughs> but he did 50 other things. And if 10 of them were good and the other 40 didn't do any harm, if he believes his pajamas help, he, that I shouldn't be allowed anywhere near him. I shouldn't be allowed near the guys using this stuff. I should be just saying, okay, let's, if they like it, keep them doing it, but let's try to add something that actually will work and then will work in the right direction. So that's kind of where I think we, sports science needs to help athletes. And I've said it for 20 years, physiologists, exercise physiologists and sports scientists have done a really bad job about helping athletes. We're doing a much better job now, but it's still not, you know, it's still not, the system is not working the way it should. It could be optimized a lot better. So I'll give you I'll give you a little uh, piggyback on that. What are the current gaps? Right, simple question. It's presenting something that has the appearance of flash, of a flashy, the shiny penny. It's presenting something that people are essentially gravitating to in this world of three second Instagram clips, right? This person, you flip something on and you look at something and you're like, that's unbelievable. I need, and I'm, I don't want to put companies out there, so I'm not going to use specific companies, but I, I'm going to be able to measure my force velocity curve. I'm going to be able to measure different location. I'm going to do all these different things, right? And you're looking at it in an instantaneous moment of time. And the challenge is that's not the reality. That's somebody's fabricated version of what it is. One of the gaps in sports science is that it is presenting something that is out of context. 
that the actual ability to apply, and I'll give you some examples, right? So there's a, a school that, that I've worked with, and in the last couple of years, they've been top in the state for football, right? Top in the state. Probably they've, they've won it the last two years that, you know, they were top three in, in the country, and, and they're a phenomenal team. You want to know how much sports science they use? Zero, none, zero. Sorry, am I yelling that into the camera? <laughs> they're, they're using, like they're thoughtful. They don't do things that are that are out of left field. There's no force plate. There's no timing system. There's a stopwatch. And here's what they do. They work consistently when no one else is working. You go into the off season when they're in all their AP physics and all these different classes that they're in. They're in the facility at 555 in the morning, four days a week, six o'clock workout start. They are consistent with it. It's a caution that, that it needs to be said that as much as something is flashy and fancy and all those things, and there is utility and usefulness for that, if the foundation is there, and I know Mal has really specific things in a detailed sense that, that I, I mean, I gravitate to, I, I really love in the development of everything that we've done with the NHL combine and hockey specifically. But at the end of the day, I don't want to have anybody think they are less of something because they don't have something. When you look at some of the quotes that come out from Kobe Bryant and they say, oh, how are you so comfortable and calm when you take that fadeaway jumper? You know, when he took the fadeaway jumper, whatever the you know seconds going on the clock, he's because I did it 10,000, 20,000 times already. It's just a repetitive motion. You will best serve your athletes to have something that is a consistent application and allow, you know, different people, like we had the, the privilege of, of being in certain environments, of learning certain things, of finding out what is it that will, to your question, move the needle. Do you need to understand something about G-Force? Hey, if it's the one thing you're looking at and you can start to understand it, put it in context, because a defenseman that's a first a D or a sixth D man, they're different. You know, don't loop them together. But if you can give some context to it, make sure your ability to apply the sports science works in your environment. The other part about this is you don't, sorry, I, I know you want to say something, just, is that you don't want to put something into an environment with sports science that disrupts the environment. If an athlete comes in and they're going to go through a process of warm up and play and all these different types of things, and they feel like they're in a fishbowl, they're standing there for five minutes for you to turn on the device. No, it's linking that gap between the original, like what they need to do on a day-to-day -day basis to create that consistency of application of work and not disrupting it, right? While you're able to collect information. Brilliant. Uh, do, do you have time guys for two more questions? Yeah. Are we good? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. This is a, this is a comment. And I talked to Reg about this, or excuse me, Mal about this before we got on the air. I call it the wizard of Oz. This is just I want you guys to comment on this, whether you agree or disagree. Now, this is specifically for the applied setting. So we're not talking about behind the scenes. Mal had mentioned the word battlefield. And I'm a firm believer in the applied setting. And it's changing more and more today, at least what I read and what I see in the professional environment. Teach the performance professional, the sports person, the technology, not the technologist, the sport. <laughs> there's a gap, right? Like there's a separation between general and battlefield if that makes sense. I'm talking about the applied setting. Do you agree, disagree with that comment? All right, you want me to jump in on this because I'll be the okay. applied guy learned in the science? If you're in the gym in the trench, if you're in there and you're feeling less of a person or less of a professional because you don't understand the force curve, like recorrect yourself. You're phenomenal at what you do. You want to be able to, at the end of the day, connect to the athlete, understand the environment they're in, and the group that you're moving forward. If you spend all your time trying to understand a force curve, garbage, it's not gonna help you. You need to understand some of it, but you need to have somebody like Mal that can really in a detailed way rip that thing apart and help you understand it. You are gonna be good at certain things. And there are lots of times where you might find somebody, you pick them out of a, a university educational environment and they're top, oh my goodness, wizards, absolute wizards. They walk into a room with athletes and the athletes looking at you going, who's that, that guy can't even put two words together. What's, you know, <laughs> and, and they might, just, it just might not be their space, right? You can flex, you can push, you should always push your limits to understand more. But what you're good at in that environment 
at the end of the day, it's a human game, right? And and there's all there. I, I know, understand we're high performance. What is all of that, right? There is elements of sports science to that, but there is the direct human connection you will have with the people around you that support the athletes, the athletes themselves, and how they're going. That is the absolute key aspect of all of this. Athletes were athletes and were being trained and being developed long before we had all these fancy high-tech gizmos. The trick is you can learn and learn some of those things, but I implore you, please do not feel like you're less of anything because you can't, you know, produce a presentation like somebody that, you know, like Mal can go and, and talk about force plates or something. There's reasons and and parts that you're that you're going to be really effective at it. Double down on it get connections, be completely comfortable looking at somebody in the eye going, you know what, I'm not really sure of all the depths of that. I know the general parts of it. We're going to bring in some people that actually spend their lifetime on the research tip of the spear. Then you can go and, and take that kind of like separation or, you know, where is the distance of, of sports science? Then you can spend your time trying to figure out how to deconstruct the lab. So when the guys walk into the training environment, they're actually standing on force plates in a room with 3D markerless motion capture, and the cameras are buried in the walls, and you don't even know what's happening, and you can create a better environment for it. Mal, pass the baton to you on that question. Well, it was funny the, the way Reg finished there, because most of what I try to do and put in place is like doing stuff with the athletes where they don't really know that you're doing it. You don't want to interfere with their what they're doing in their environment with their team. I'm an outsider and I shouldn't be the person talking to the athlete because I usually, when I work with teams and in different sports, I, I'll usually go and it'll not be to the athletes. It'll be to those looking after the athletes. I'm going to depress you because I'm going to tell you a lot of things that you think are this or not this. And, but that's my job is to, provide you with the information so that you can operationalize things and you can tell me what actually does work for you and then we'll figure out why it works so I can be educated by it. But the key is to be able to not interfere with the athlete, figure out what's going on and keep them doing what they're doing and then refine it. So what sports science is all about, the aggregation of marginal gains. If we can do little bits of things that are positive and everybody else at every other level, coaching and every other level, management do, are doing little bits that are beneficial. The aggregation of marginal gains will give us a good result in the end. So winning is all about the aggregation of marginal gains in my world. Last question for you both, maybe a different one. Maybe it's a, maybe this will, we'll start with Reg, but if I know I'm going to get fired one day by you, what are my objectives for the position? Meaning, if you are the sports performance director right now, Reg, and you're hiring an individual, how do you objectify that position? Because it's very hard to do in sport. Is it wins and losses? Is it injuries? Is it communication? Does it all filter in to one? How do we objectify the position? Hmm. Wow. Okay. So we'll start that a little, a little bit with this. You need to understand what the, like the actual job in the environment is there to do. So if you have somebody that's there and they're trying to develop athletes, as an example, right? And the measuring stick is wins and losses of the team. Nope, not going to work. If it's popularity, I like you, not going to work. Now, obviously, there's personality parts to this. You need to be able to say, what is that person as a staff member going to do when they walk in the door? What are the things? Do we understand what a common objective is, right? So what's the objective that we're going after? We want to create a consistency of the athlete's ability to train, and we want to improve them, to Mal's point, incremental gains. We want to pr improve them so every day they're coming in, they're training a little bit better, they're improving in the ways that we need to understand, right? Like we're talking about aerobic, anaerobic way back in the beginning. Like what are the things that we're looking to do? Have a clear objective have clear, like clear uh, key results that you're looking at uh, the ability to measure along the way for that. So when you can go in and say, look, I know you're going to execute these things. Here's 10 things that you're going to do. You're going to make sure the athlete environment is clean and safe. There's good communication with the athlete. You are proactively engaging the athlete to help them understand what their program is. You had to build the program. You get the idea. There's things they're actually going to do. That's what you measure them with. Did they create the environment? 
Did they have the program? Did they effectively bring it across? Was the monitoring of that program done in its explanation? First of all, you know that that's assuming that you've already gone and, and figured out that you're measuring the right stuff. But did that was all that outlaid at the beginning, right? Not did we win ten games into the season? Did you put that stuff in place? One of the worst things that happens is athletes show up and they don't know what's going on. They're like, we're, we're doing force plate jumps today. We're, we're doing testing. What the, What are you talking about? Because the coach had a conversation, you know, on a day off that we need to measure something or do something. So when it comes to a staff member and hiring them and evaluating them, you need to be really clear on what they're going to execute, what they can control. And then once you have that laid out, now, and this is again to Mal's thing of incremental gains, the actions and activities that you are taking are creating a safe and effective environment with a clear program that's targeted to the right things. And we're worried about that individual doing that. Now, Excellent. you can advance on it after it, but you need to be able to measure what they actually do and have impact on. Mal, last one for you. What's the key to success for the relationship that you sustained with Reg over the years? I mean, obviously from first meeting face-to-face, is it just been open and honest conversation, sharing? And what are your keys if you could define two or three of, of that Batman and Robin type uh, team? <laughs> uh, objectivity, humility, and honesty, I would say. You know, and we're all subjective. It's very hard to be objective all the time. We all have our little hunches. I have them, you know. And and I, my problem is I'm Irish, so I'm extremely stubborn with my little hunches. But <laughs> Trying to maintain some degree of objectivity and, you know, new evidence. You got to go, you know, it's new evidence. You got to see what the evidence is and go, okay, I got to change my thought on that. But being objective and honest uh, is, is, is critical and be, that'll, be, that'll help in the, in the long term with anything, really. Our guests today have been Dr. Mal McHugh and Reg Grant. Gents, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you very much.